Friends, today is Trinity Sunday. It's a, it's a day Christians traditionally have set aside to remember and to celebrate one of our most important and core beliefs, that, that God is Trinitarian, which is to say that God is one God who is three persons, three divine persons who are one God. Traditionally, we speak of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or sometimes we say God is Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, or if you use the language of the benediction that I say each week, you can say that God is the God who gives birth to your soul, the God who is your truest friend, and the God who comforts you in the darkest night. And I think it's important to set aside at least one Sunday a year to, to think about the Trinity. After all, it's kind of hard to imagine a more important belief in a religious system than a belief about the identity of God. But the trouble with the Trinity is that it really doesn't make any sense. And it's not like we can just go to the Bible to look for an officially sanctioned and canonical explanation about how God can be both three divine entities and yet still be one God. Because the idea that God is Trinitarian, well, that doesn't start showing up for a good 70 years or so after the last book of the New Testament was written. And when the idea first shows up, there isn't anything like an explanation for how God can be three and one at the same time. Explanations for the Trinity don't really, really don't appear until later, and, and when they do appear, I don't find them to be terribly convincing. Mostly, it seems to me that when the theologians of the early church tried to explain the Trinity, they did a good job of talking about why the Creator and Christ and the Spirit are all God, and they did an equally good job of explaining why it was important for God to be one God. That was something that was important both to Jewish Christians and to Christians who came from a Stoic background. But, as far as how both could be true at the same time, well, that's where things fall apart in the logic department. And by the way, I would love to be the first person who has pointed this out. It would make me kind of hip in an edgy, contrarian sort of way. But in reality, my old buddy John Calvin beat me to the sweet spot of cool descent something like 470 years ago. Now, Calvin was a thoroughgoing Trinitarian, but he wasn't too impressed by those who insisted on trying to figure out ways to explain the Trinity. Calvin points out that none of the writers of the early church, the, the theologians who devised the idea of the Trinity, none of them, according to Calvin, none of them agree with each other when it comes to the Trinity, and most of them are also inconsistent in what they say from one letter or sermon to the next. This rather candid observation about the Trinity inspired Calvin to write, Whatever by ourselves we think about God is foolishness, and whatever we speak is absurd. I'm not inclined to disagree. Now, I am inclined to suppose that Calvin just might find my thoughts on the Trinity to be both foolish and absurd, but I am of the opinion that when the early church came up with the idea of the Trinity, they were not discovering something new about God. Rather, they were trying somewhat unsuccessfully to wrap their heads around a divine mystery, something that could never be entirely discovered or properly described. That, by the way, is why I chose Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 5 for this weekend's scripture lesson. As I said earlier, the doctrine of the Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, at least not in a way that is systematic or anything like the theological explanations for God's identity that start showing up in Christian circles a couple of hundred years after Jesus' earthly ministry drew to a close. There are one or two passages that seem to describe God not just as creator, but also as Christ or as Holy Spirit. But instead of using one of those passages, I chose a passage that speaks of God's mysterious ways. It's a passage that warns against people who try to circumvent mystery with plausible arguments, which I take to mean that we should avoid being hoodwinked into being overly confident in matters of faith. I think that is really sound advice, and it is why, in the end, I actually really love the doctrine of the Trinity and why I consider myself to be a Trinitarian Christian. I happen to find it helpful to think of God as one who creates, as one who is among us, and as one who inspires and comforts us. But how God can be all these things at the same time while still being one God? Well, that's a mystery. And because the Trinity is a logical impossibility, it is a mystery we will never solve, which is good. It keeps us humble, or it should anyway. Christians historically have 
not been particularly good at being humble, but we should be humble. A mysterious, logical impossibility is our most important, fundamental religious belief. And as far as I'm concerned, that means we don't get to judge anyone else for whatever they may believe, no matter how offbeat. Because it's not often you can beat the Trinity in terms of doctrinal eccentricity. What I like about the doctrine of the Trinity is that it invites us into a divine mystery without laying upon us the burden of having to figure it out, because the Trinity is not a riddle that can be solved. Rather, the Trinity is a tool, a lens through which we can, in a limited way, observe the God who creates us, the God who loves us, and the God who inspires us in ways that feel both distinct and entirely the same. And whenever I am talking to people who do not believe as I believe, people who use different language to describe how they experience God, or people who adhere to belief systems that I find to be odd and somewhat unlikely, whenever I'm talking to people like that, I try to remember the Trinity. I try to be aware of how my own tradition uses a logical impossibility to describe God. Ideally, when everything is going as it is supposed to go, the Trinity should keep us humble. And if everything is going as it should be, the Trinity also can keep us curious and in awe of the beautiful mysteries that surround us. You know, the bird song that greets us in the morning, the play of sunshine and leaves or the smell of roses, the way musical notes can come together to create interesting and often beautiful chords. I mean, I could go on and on. We live in a world of wonder that is filled with mystery and adventure. And to me, the doctrine of the Trinity affirms the world as we know it. A world created by an unknowable God, who also is the God who knows us better than we even know ourselves. The God who is also the God who comforts us and inspires us when we are confused or in need of hope. I don't know how it all works, but it's all the same God, and I, for one, am glad that I don't have to figure out how God manages to be one in three and three in one. Presbyterians are fond of saying that the chief end of humanity is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. I'm really happy that I don't have to define God for you in order for you to do what is pleasing to God or for God to be pleasing to you. God simply is. Each one of us is welcome to plumb the mysteries of God's existence, but none of us has to do that. And if we choose to take a crack at, the, at trying to solve the mystery that is God, well, it's a task that we will never finish, though we will certainly learn a lot along the way. And to me, that is actually really, really good news. Huh. I gotta have an ending. So dearly beloved, I don't really know how to end this sermon. So let me just say that this year has been a year full of unknowns. It's been a year in which I've never known from week to week what to expect. It's been a year as a pastor where I've not been able to know for sure how to do the right thing during a pandemic. This is my last sermon that I'm going to film and honestly, I don't know what's next. I don't know, even if I remember how to preach from a manuscript in front of people, I don't know how we're going to worship together. There is so much that I don't know. And one of the great things about worshiping a God who is shrouded in mystery, a God whose very identity is a mystery, is that as I walk into the mystery of what life will be beyond COVID, Heck, it's a mystery that's even between now and the end of COVID. As I, as I walk into the life of a pastor as the COVID pandemic winds down, it's all a mystery. And the fact that the God that I'm doing my best to worship is also mysterious, well, I take comfort in that. I don't know God completely. I don't know the future even slightly. But the God that I don't know completely walks with me as I walk into a future that I don't know. And there's something about that that works for me spiritually. And my invitation to you is that you allow this same unknowing, the, the, the unknowing of God 
and the unknowing of the future. My, my, my prayer is that you will bring those two together. That as you walk into whatever the future holds, that you will bring the God you cannot fully know, that you'll bring that God with you into the future. And trust that the God you don't know will sustain you and support you and comfort you in the future, which also is a mystery. May it be so. May this God be with you. May this God who created you, this God who knows you, may this God give you inspiration and strength and hope in the days to come. Amen.